You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Rooted. It's our bonus week on it. Because today we're going to talk about being fruitful. In the kingdom of God, we understand that fruitfulness is part of this agrarian kind of farm culture that would have been the first century. What does it mean to be fruitful? It means that what we plant, we expect to harvest from. When we talk about being fruitful today, we must look at being rooted. What does it mean to be rooted? I have experienced things that are rooted in our culture. The, um, so this past, I think it was May, I don't remember particularly, but Justin and Marcy and Erica and I were given the opportunity to go to Passion Church down in Atlanta, Georgia, and we went down there for the, their worship conference, and it was legit. I mean, it was awesome, and we had a great time. One night, we were walking through downtown Atlanta, going to dinner. We walked into a restaurant, and the lady said, did you see Mel Gibson? And I was like... Like in Braveheart? I mean, of course I did. I'm a guy, you know. And she's like, no, he just left. I'm like, what? Because I have no problem making them uncomfortable. I love, like if I, like I bumped into Toby Mac, I'm like, you Toby? He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, I'm Eric. You want a picture with me? He's like, sure. No. You know, we had a picture. We had a moment. I love that. So I'm like, where's Mel? Well, he just left. I'm like, which way did he go? I think he turned right. Save a table for four. And out I went. I ran around the corner, and I spotted Mel's awesome frame, so handsome, and I took off jogging up the street, and I was like, this is when I regret not being in shape, and I'm like, Mel, Mel, hey, and he's just like, hey, you know, because he's he's got really lovely eyes, and I have no problem having a man crush on Mel Gibson. Did you see what he did to the English? Don't judge me. And um, I go up to him, and I'm like, hey, hey, I was just wondering did you want a picture with me today? And he goes, he put his, ha- his hand on my back. I have witnesses. He's like, not today, buddy. I'm like, I don't even care. <laughs> I'm his buddy. Mm. So I walked away. I'm like, all right, you guys keep walking. Oh, because it was a little uphill and I was struggling. So um, I go back and we get to the restaurant and the lady's like, would you like to sit at his table? There's four of us. There were only two of them. I'm like, clearly. And then um, we sit down and Marcy Colleen's like, there's a napkin on the floor. <laughs> we have it. We stole it. It's a prize we're going to give away one day. So when I talk about this, nobody's like, Mel who? Mel who? Some of you who are a little older are like, you mean Mad Max? Some of you are like, Braveheart? Patriot? You know, nobody remembers the one where he's in a time capsule. But we know this guy. He's rooted into our culture. He's a big part of who we are as Americans, even though he's an Aussie, and we know, we know him. We have this concept of him, and he's connected to who we are. I want you to hold on to that just for me. We're going to come back to it, but I want to go to the scripture now. I want to look at Psalm 1 one last time as we talk about being rooted, and I want you to maybe feel it with me today. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the path that sinners take, or sit in the seat of mockers. But the blessed one, their delight is in the law of God, the counsel of God in Scripture. And on that counsel of God in Scripture, in the whole of Scripture, they meditate day and night. And because of that delight, because of that rootedness, because of their meditation, their ruminating, their thinking on Scripture, they are like a tree that is planted by a stream of water. And that tree gives its fruit in season, and its leaves never wither. Everything they do prospers, but not so the wicked. The wicked are like chaff. They they blow away. The wind just blows them away. So we know this, that the wicked will not stand in the judgment. And sinners will not be in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We need to understand the sacred rhythms of what God called us to be as Christians. 
what God called us to be as Christians. We need it to become our culture, our identity, so much more than something we know. We need it to become something we chase after. So, just go back to the Mel Gibson thing with me. When I started talking about Mel Gibson, you're like, oh yeah, I know that guy. How do we get something in our culture so rooted into our lives that when I say a name, you can picture his rage in Braveheart when they kill and murder his wife, Murrin? Right? You remember him in Patriot. You remember you have these emotions. You actually feel, at the mention of his name, a sense of identification and connection. It evokes memory. It evokes emotion. It evokes this sense of love and connection to someone he is not. He has played a role, but he's done so well. At the mention of his name, everybody begins to connect and thinks, I don't know if I'd chase him, but I'd I'd definitely steal the napkin. Why? Because we know him. We know Mel. We know what he's done. We think he's awesome, if not a little crazy. And we really, as Christians, love his work with the passion of the Christ. We have this connection, don't we? Well, the question then becomes, is our connection valid or real? I would say to you, absolutely not. Because he didn't want a picture with me. I knew him. I knew him. I could tell by his walk and his gait, that's Mel Gibson, and I took off running after him. And when I got there, he did all he could to dismiss me graciously by, again, touching my shoulder and being very friendly, but pushing me away. Not today, buddy. Right? See, I'm not a part of his life. Though he's a big part of our culture, I have no connection with him. What's the difference when we look at this rootedness, because he has a rootedness in our culture, what's the difference between Jesus and Mel Gibson? Well, there's vast numbers of differences, but let's talk about the celebrity of it. Jesus Christ is well known in our culture. There are many who say they know him. But here's the main difference. Jesus Christ, when we come to him, invites us to become part of the story. He not only invites us to become it, but he says, if you're going to walk with me, if you're going to share this road with me, you have to not only know about me, you have to get to know me. Remember our benediction this, this past three weeks? Walk with me. Work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace, Jesus said. Jesus doesn't expect us to go away. He expects us to walk closely, walk with me, work with me, connect with me. What we have to do is understand that just because we know something about Jesus doesn't mean we've rooted ourselves in him. But Psalm 1 takes us to a place where we understand the necessity of being rooted The necessity of it. If we are going to bear fruit, if our lives are going to give witness to Christ, we understand the necessity of being connected. John 15 says it this way in the words of Jesus. He says, I am the vine. I am the tap root. It's a vineyard uh, visual for a vineyard planter. I am the vine. I'm the one attached to the ground. Jesus says, I'm the one with deep roots. And you are the branches. And every branch that is connected to me bears fruit. What does that mean? Jesus doesn't want to say, go away, buddy. He says, walk with me. Work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Know me. We have to understand the tension between being celebrity chasing, you know, kind of Christians and people who know Jesus. We're not chasing a celebrity. We're knowing the Son of God. He is not a topic to be discussed. He is the life and the air we breathe. And we have to be in that tension and that resident discomfort of saying, truly, do we believe that he is the vine and we are the branches? Or is he a bit of a branch of our life? something we do on Sundays or Mondays? Is he what we kind of, you know, allow into our life or is he our actual life? Colossians, the book of Colossians, it's an epistle written by the Apostle Paul to the people of Colossae. In Colossians 2, it says this, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up 
in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Get that language. In him. Rooted and built up in him. It's hard to imagine separation when you're that deeply intertwined, when he is the vine and you are the branchers, branches. So what we have to do is say this, how do we root ourselves in Christ? Because this farm knowledge doesn't really help someone like me who only murders plants, right? If you may, I, I can only eat plants. I can't grow them. I'm horrible. If I was a farmer, we'd all be a lot thinner. I, I mean, I could grow cows, but I don't know anything else about growing green things. But I do know this, that roots matter. Roots really matter. How do we root ourselves in Christ? Well, the reality of this is, as we've talked about it, to walk with the Lord connected to his living, active word, the Bible, be in scripture, continually. We've been in one scripture for four weeks, and we're still unpacking some of the mystery of it. And we could go on a lot longer. Be in scripture and spend time in prayer. It's an act of living faith to be a prayerful person, praying over that which you can't see an end to, and taking your hand off the activity and giving it to God. Spend time with God in his word and prayer. Pray for your family. Pray for those who you know aren't saved. Pray for your pastor. Pray for the leaders in the church. Pray for your small group. Pray for anyone you can think of. Pray for the lady at the grocery store who gave you a dirty look. I don't know why she did, but she probably probably need you to pray for her. Just spend time praying. Lift up to God what he loves most, the people who don't and do know him. Pray. Be in relationship with him. Again, how do we root ourselves in Christ? We walk with the Lord, studying his word and living in prayer, but we also understand that we stand with other believers. We stand with other believers and we do this on Sundays and Mondays. Why? Because it matters, because it will always matter that the gathered people of God link arms and remind themselves that we are not beholden to that culture. We are called to live our lives for the one who gave his life for us. And so we do this linked up and we kind of lean in and we know with this big herd of people that we are, we can push back the veil of darkness and the kingdom of God can be brought to pass on this generation, in this town, in this state, moving outwards. It is our opportunity to stand up and say, you know what, no, culture doesn't define us. Jesus does. And his calling rings louder than their anxiety-ridden invitations. We're gonna be us. In him. The third thing we do is we stand, well, we stand with other believers, but then we sit with Christians. We don't sit with the mockers. We sit with other Christians. We gather in these groups, and it's it's a little anxious, but in the end, groups is where we do discipleship. Groups, small groups of people are actually amazing. I think the church has it a little wrong when it comes to cliques. They're actually friends. And we're like, we need to break that click up. I'm like, no, we need to give them the word of God and turn them loose. Let them be close. Let them love one another. I love, not clickiness, but I love tight friendships. And one of the things we in, in the West, especially in the United States, have mistaken is doing this once a week for an hour is going to change our lives. It won't change your life. It'll make you feel guilty about what you did last night. And you'll forget about it by the time you do something bad, maybe even today when the lions do what the lions do to us. Every week, right? So, so we sit with other Christians in groups to be rooted in relationships with spirit-filled, godly people who know the struggles we have. We open up a little. We live in that resident tension with them. But here's the reality. If we do those things, if we walk with the Lord, if we come and we gather and we worship and we are intentional in our relationships and our group-focused gatherings I believe this, a fruitful life will come out of that. It will be a life rooted deeply. See, those things we talked about are all about knowing God. But a fruitful tree makes him known. Nobody goes to Crane's Orchard except for, well, what? What do we go there for? Apples, right? This time of year, sweet little grannies. They turn into mean old ladies with wagons because they're making sauce for the family. I will break your ankles, right? I have seen elderly women pulling carts 
heavy laden with apples, with a determined look in their eye. And they didn't come to Cranes to make a friend or have a pie. They came to Cranes because they knew there was fruit there. Why do you think the world would come to us if there was something worth having? If our lives had the fruit of the kingdom of God hanging off it, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. If you had those things present here, juxtapose, not juxtapose, hold that up against Washington, D.C. this past week. If we had those fruits and those fruits hanging, which one would you come to? You couldn't pay me enough to be in Washington right now. That's a rough place. And I don't see much love, joy, peace, patience, but I do see it in the church. I do see it here. You will be like a tree, Psalm 1 says, planted by streams of water, which means this, God plants you in the perfect spot for you to thrive, in the perfect spot for you to give forth your abundance. He plants you by a stream of living water. And who is the living water? but the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who cleanses and nourishes and replenishes us for the work he's called us to do. He plants us in Christ. We are a tree rooted in Christ. And it matters that we understand that our lives are called to be productive for the kingdom of God. And the church gets it wrong so often when we live these fruitful lives and we think it's for us. How creepy would it be, and I mean legitimately terrifying Halloween corn maze creepy, if you went to Crane's Orchard and an apple tree was eating apples? You'd be like, that's terrifying. (laughs) What if they become omnivores and they look at me and think, that one looks ripe for the picking. The tree doesn't eat its own fruit. The fruit of the tree is for the benefit of the community around us. The fruit of this community is for the benefit of the world around us, that they will come to know the love of Christ, the peace of Christ, the joy of Christ, the patience that comes in loving Christ more than we love ourselves. See, when we look at being a tree planted, we realize that when we're rooted in Christ, our lives will give off something that the world desperately needs. But we keep thinking it's for us. When I say, I want you in the word of God, it's not for me. When I say, I want you in church on Sundays, it's not for me. But if nobody came, it would be lame. So it's a little bit. Um, but, But mostly, this is what we do because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. We do this to remind ourselves that we're not alone in the battle. And when I say that I don't want it from you, I just want it for you, it's because it's life to be connected in this community. When I say be in a group, it's not something we want from you something we want for you, to be in relationships that are productive and fruitful, that care, that love, that listen, that challenge, and don't allow the status quo to lead you down a road of mediocrity that has no kingdom impact. Let the truth be heard in this place today. The fruits of this community are not for us. Though we will enjoy being a place often visited like Cranes is this time of year. You can't even park in Finville because of what people expect at that place. You shouldn't be able to park at the church, any church, because of the fruit people expect to find in this place. It should be filled with lives of Christians who are faithfully living out their life in Christ, rooted deeply in him, and blessing the world around them with the things that God grows out of their lives. Don't forget that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to think back with me to the story of Joseph. We talked about it all summer long. The story of Joseph, and his story probably has an element that you identify with. A lot of heartache, a lot of abandonment, a lot of abuse, a lot of pain, a disheartened, lost in prison, all these different things. We can look at Joseph and say, yes, yes and amen. There's some of those things in my life. There's some of that heartache. But look what God did with the young man who was rooted in him. He brought life to a world that was famished and ravaged by a drought. He brought life to a place that was dying. Why? Because Joseph was rooted in the Lord. His life was life-giving. 
and we have to live in that tension. Whatever we do might not prosper us, but it should prosper and bring glory to God and expand the kingdom. We should be people who are known, not only for knowing about Jesus, but for looking an awful lot like him by the fruit, by the life that we live, the things that grow out of us. So what happens if you don't have roots in Christ? Psalms 1 says it this way. They're like chaff. Brought an onion today. Because I've been given the illustration. Pam, I am very sorry. But Eric Peterson spilled coffee and we just had the carpets cleaned, so blame him for what's going on. Chaff. What is it? It's like onion paper that the wind... I mean... See the difference? Life. Something whole. Chaff... It's just the paper that holds it together. It's worthless. It gets in the way. It's hard to vacuum up, I will suppose soon. (laughs) Right? What happens when we don't have roots? We are fruitless. We are fickle. We are restless. We are easily uprooted and planted in the next cultural theme, next cultural movement, next identity that the world gives us, and we're lost for usefulness in the kingdom because we have no roots. We are simply like chaff, and whatever wants to be done with us, well, let the wind blow. Let the wind blow. It'll float away. You'll move to on to the next thing. This is not some movement of the moment. This is the eternal life of the Christian rooted in Christ, made purposeful in Christ for the glory of God. Those who are easily shaken and driven off to other things lack roots. May that never be said of us. May it never be said of us that we, A, didn't count the cost and get invested in the kingdom of God. We have to count the cost and then get invested. So, I want to invite you to check your root system. Check your root system. Check in on the dark, unseen areas of your life where, well, well, there should be something growing. See, roots are hard to quantify until the wind blows, and then we all know if we have them or not. Roots are hard to quantify. Nobody looks at a tree and is like, man, beautiful roots. No, no. Nobody does that. Chuck Swindoll tells a story of, um, of a tree in his front yard that was beautiful. It was just like super full of leaves, and it had blossoms every uh, spring in Texas there. And whenever a good gust of wind came, it'd be like, and tip over. And he'd go over, and he'd pull that tree back up. He would put posts in the ground, and then the wind would blow, and over he'd go, and Chuck would be out there pulling his tree back up. And he went and got whatever a tree person is called, arborist? I, I'm going to go with arborist. And um, he goes and gets this guy to come out, and the guy looks at him and he says, it's a great tree. It's just top heavy. It looks great. There's just no roots. Oh, man. I think you could put that on my tombstone some days. Looks good. Needs roots. Does that, rec- does that resonate with you? Looks good as a Christian till the wind blows and life tips over. May it never be said of us that we weren't willing to costly and intentionally check our root system and see if we maybe need to do more work in the dark, hidden, unseen areas of our lives down where roots grow and get rooted not into this church, not into these things, but into Christ, into Christ's church, into Christ's body into Christ's mission, not ours. Because we are not chasing the celebrity Jesus. We are chasing the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who calls us to run faithfully the race set before us. What does that mean? It means that we are challenged by the Lord Jesus Christ to live his life in this time we have. It is not easy. But you got to check your root system. And the connection to Christ must be constant. You can cut yourself off. And if you do that, why don't you go today, if you have ivy growing anywhere, and cut it, pull part of it down, create a good gap in it, and watch the ivy up the tree die. It'll be withered by the end of the day. It'll be dead within a week, and its life will be completely gone. And in a few weeks, you can just pull the vine down. You don't have to crawl up a tree to kill ivy. You just have to kill it and disconnect it from the root. We Christians are called to do one thing, to remember that he is the vine, we are the branches, and every Christian who is rooted in Christ 
will expand the kingdom of God. It will expand the kingdom of God. And you can say, Eric, I can't do this. This is, this is bigger than me. I'm, I'm kind of lousy as a Christian. I have wonderful news for you. So am I. I'm a terrible Christian until Jesus gets involved. Until Jesus Christ and his spirit get in my life and I start listening, courageously obeying, and being willing to see things die in order that new life may come. It's not about what I can do. It's about being faithfully connected to the one who changed everything. The great I am, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who I invite you to stand and sing about right now. Join me. I love this dirty little onion. I was just standing there looking at it. It doesn't look real good. It's got some dirt on it. It came from deep in the ground, right? But it adds so much to whatever you're going to cook with it, right? Have you ever had something that's missing one of these dirty little bulbs from Hudsonville, right? And you know it's missing it? I think quite often the same could be said for most organized, most well put together people. There's something missing. I would say it's the fruit. The fruit of a life that is rooted in God because you can't fake fruit. I don't know if you've ever picked up a wax apple on accident and laid into it, but you know real quick that wasn't for human consumption. Religion isn't for human consumption. Being rooted in Christ, oh man. There's nothing better. And our life will give out an abundance that the world can't deny. So here's my challenge. Hear the invitation. You can give me every excuse why you don't want to be in church, why you don't want to study scripture because you don't understand, why you don't want to pray because it feels weird to talk when you're alone, why you don't want to be in a group because you're risky, and I will believe none of it. Because the Christian life was not one called to just be easy and whatever made us comfortable. The Christian life called us to be transformed into Jesus' image. And the only way we can do that, the only way we can produce real fruit that you can sink your teeth into is to be spirit-filled, courageously obedient people who are being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And you don't have to do it on your own. Because Jesus said, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Then come to me, get away with me. And I will teach you how to recover your life and how to live your life. Walk with me, Jesus said. Work with me, Jesus said. I will teach you the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't make you do anything horrible or ill-fitting. I have made you for a purpose and you'll live into it. I'll teach you how to live your life, recover your life. Live freely and lightly. We, the church, must either believe what Jesus said and start living into it or stop pretending that this is enough. We have to make a choice. And as you make that choice, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, it is time for the church to decide where it will be rooted. You are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.